Hi class, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about NMR, give you a little more insight into NMR. Um, so I'm going to talk about the molecule that we've been making this week because its NMR is a little more complex than you might think. So um, <laughs> well, my marker doesn't work. So um, here we go. So we were making. this molecule, and you are reducing, getting mainly the S enantiomer, okay? And, um, you know, in lab, I've been talking to you about and getting you to think about how the NMR changes when you put this group in, okay? And one of the things I want to point out is that these two hydrogens are actually different, okay? Like, I could call this let's say make that a wedge, this HA and this HB, okay? Basically, if you have hydrogens that are on the same carbon, or any pair of hydrogens for that matter, and you replace them with what I will call a test group, and when you replace them uh, sequentially with a test group, if you end up with diastereomers, those hydrogens are called diastereotopic hydrogens, okay? So let me write that down. If we replace each hydrogen sequentially with a test group, G, I'll just call it G, and if the result is diastereomers, Okay, then the hydrogens are called diastereotopic. Okay, now similarly, if you replace the hydrogen sequentially with a test group and you, the result is enantiomers, if the result of that process is enantiomers, they're called enantiotopic. If you do the same process and you get the same molecules, if they're the same molecules, they are homotopic. Okay, now why is this important? Well, it's important in reactions, but it's also important in spectroscopy. So if, if hydrogens are diastereotopic, they can be distinguished in the NMR. And the other point is they split each other. Which is kind of interesting. So they're actually different hydrogens. So in this case, if I put a test group G in here, okay, and then I compared it with the molecule where I put the test group in the back, and keep the hydrogen in the front, I think you would agree, because there's a pre-existing asymmetric carbon in the molecule, that these two molecules are diastereomers. And that means the two hydrogens are diastereotopic, and they can be distinguished in the NMR, or at least they'll give different peaks. And the reason I'm bringing this up is I believe on our very high field 400 megahertz NMR, we're actually seeing a distinction between these two hydrogens, which is rather interesting. Okay, so um, what I'm saying here is that um, these two are actually, on average, seeing a slightly different magnetic field, or they're experiencing a slightly different magnetic field. One way to kind of justify it in your mind is if you think about hydrogen bonding perhaps occurring between the H on the so, and by the way, a hydrogen bond is between an H on an electronegative atom and an electronegative atom. It's just a dipolar interaction. If you imagine that hydrogen bond and it being sort of like the fumarase reaction we do in the fall, this has a preferred conformer, and, you, and if it's really kind of sitting in a preferred conformation, perhaps it's interacting with that, but let's say it's interacting here, then these two hydrogens are, are seeing, have kind of like different faces on the ring, okay? Um, so, you know, just like if you have a ring, 
if I have a ring like this and I have an OH group like this, these two hydrogens actually experience a different environment because one's on the same side as the OH and one's on the other. Now, it doesn't have to be dramatic, but it's going to be different. Okay, so, um, what does this mean? Well, what it means is These two guys are different. Oh, let's go to our reduced product. So this is our thing we made a big deal about, our redu reduced product. These hydrogens, right, this, I'll call this HA, this HB, and this HC up here, HA is going to be split by HB. So let's just look at HA. HA is going to be split by HB into a doublet of some kind. So what we do to show this situation is to, to draw a splitting diagram. So HB is split by HB, HA is split by HB into a doublet. Then HA is also split by HC into a doublet. Now the size of these splittings has to do with the coupling constants. The same thing is true of HB. HB is split into a doublet by HA. It would have the same interaction, whatever that might be. And then HB would be split by HC also into a doublet. Okay? These are called doublets of doublets. Okay? So what I did there, this is just a mechanism to get to the answer. So this has a certain interaction and it's of a certain magnitude. Just like in the fall when you did the fumarase reaction, you discovered the magnitude of the interaction between the two hydrogens in your molecule and it was 10 hertz. That's how it manifests itself in the, in the NMR. So this has a certain value, this has a certain value, and this has a certain value, a certain magnitude of interaction. They're not always equal interactions. And when they're not equal, um, you have to consider them individually. So what I'm saying is you can draw these splitting trees to figure it out. So again, you have to consider each interaction individually. So HA is split by HB and there's some magnitude to that interaction, which I'm indicating with this distance here. And then HA is split by HC, and there's some magnitude to that interaction, which I'm indicating there. If the magnitudes were all the same, it would just look like a triplet. But they're not, so it's probably in your spectrum going to look more like a doublet of doublets. And you might see several doublets of doublets. That's what I was kind of observing in the spectrum. Um, generally speaking, so similarly, on the same note, if I were talking about HC, it could be quite complicated because HC really has, um, let's call these HD, HD, and HD. HC is split by HD and it's split by HA and it's split by HB. So if I was looking at this, I could say HC, I start with a singlet, then I'd say, okay, it's, it's split by HA into a doublet. Okay, so kind of a normal doublet size. All right, then let's say HC is split by HB into a doublet. So then, I, and I'd have to know the magnitude of that interaction to show this. And people kind of model e these things when they're um, looking at the spectrum and trying to interpret it. Right, and then HC is going to be split by these into a quartet. So these could all be split into four lines depending on the the magnitude of the interaction. I'll just draw like these trees. And they, these could all overlap with each other. So I'm splitting each one into a quartet like this and so forth. Sorry about my handwriting, etc. All right, so you say, okay, that's great. That's a big mess. And it is a big mess. So the point is when the hydrogens are different for a given hydrogen, the interactions are not all the same. And you actually have to consider them individually. So this would really be a doublet of doublets of quartets. And again, what this looks like at the end has to do with the magnitude of those interactions. And sometimes when people are looking at a splitting, they kind of model it. Okay? All right, now, and again, th this is just a device to get there. It's almost like a frost circle. It's just a way to get there. I'm just taking each, this distance would be what you would get out of the spectrometer or what you pull off a ta table. Okay, I hope that made some sense. I'm a little worried that it didn't. Okay, so I'm just warning you, very complicated splitting here, and possibly 
very complex splitting here. I think I've, I've, I've observed it. I expect these to, to be like a series of doublets, not just n plus 1. Okay? Um, now, the other things you should note about this molecule, as I've said to many people, the best thing you could do for yourself is take the paper out, and within the paper is the NMR data, and to take the NMR data and see what you have from that NMR data. Then, figure out what extra peaks you have. And a lot of people have a lot of extra peaks. A lot of people have peaks from this compound, so you should think about what the NMR of this would look like, and it really has some overlap with this. This piece is going to be the same, or very similar. Um, think about ethyl ether, because a lot of people have ethyl ether in their sample. It's possible you have a tiny bit of ethanol in your sample because we were doing um, a fermentation process. And by the way, a couple people said to me that well, because we were doing um, aerobic, um, working with yeast in an aerobic way, that we wouldn't be producing um, alcohol and CO2. But um, fermentation in the presence of a lot of sugar is actually the favored process even when there's oxygen around. So I'm assuming there that that is mainly a fermentation process that we're carrying out. Um, it's called, it had, there's a name for it, but there's a name for the process. Um, the other thing I want to point out, so, so you should be, have your eye out for contaminants, and you can actually look the contaminants up on the web to see if they're in your spectrum. The other thing I want to say is about OHs, right? OHs are funny in the NMR. First of all, OHs usually don't split. And the reason is, you know, I told you this is the neighbor that is in home. But these are slightly acidic, they're mildly acidic, and they're, in, they're very slightly acidic. And they're in sort of like chemical exchange when you're running the NMR, like the hydrogen's coming on and off. And it's not really residing there in such a way that you can have the coupling interaction. The other thing about OHs is, is they can be anywhere. They can be anywhere from 0.5 to 5 ppm. And this is because they're actually quite shielded by the lone pairs, and they really should be at 0.5 parts per million. But because of hydrogen bonding, they are deshielded a bit, and they move quite a bit depending on the hydrogen bonding. So this usually appears as kind of a broad singlet, or just a singlet, a broader singlet in your spectrum. It, but it could be anywhere. So if your samples really dilute, you're not going to have much hydrogen bonding. If you don't have a lot of, much, a lot of hydrogen bonding, this will be at relatively low ppm. If, it, if your sample is really concentrated, you get lots of hydrogen bonding, and it, it could appear at a higher ppm. And again, this may be just intramolecularly hydrogen bonding, in which case they won't be that varied. But I did see some variation from student to student. Um, so again, just finishing up, alcohol position is variable depending on the extent of hydrogen bonding in your sample. And the samples vary a lot, usually, based on how much you dilute them or concentrate them. And everybody had different concentrations. And then the other thing is, remember, OHs are normally singlets. Okay, so that's it. Thanks.